So I'm uh, David Petrov. Uh, I'm a PGY6 independent uh, interventional resident here at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Um, I did my uh, residency at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and came here to Rush to do my last year of training. So interventional radiology um, is a up and coming specialty, although it's been around for quite some time. Um, what we kind of do in the way uh, a lot of us like to define it is big things through small incisions. So we consider ourselves a minimally invasive uh, image guided procedural or surgical specialty. Um, and typically, you know, uh, we do diagnostic radiology training and then we uh, kind of uh, learn how to do procedures along the way. Um, and so interventional radiology to me kind of encompasses three main pillars, um, which would be imaging, okay, being experts at understanding imaging, cross-sectional uh, CT and MRI, as well as fluoroscopy uh, or just 2D x-ray. Um, it also includes you know, a vast array of procedures. Uh, we kind of work all over the body, whether it be uh, in the abdomen, uh, in the biliary system, in vessels, um, we do biopsies. Uh, we kind of encompass the entire uh, scope of uh, image guided procedures. And then the third thing that really defines IR, and uh, more and more as time has been going on, even through my training, is really being clinically oriented and focused. So a lot of us now have IR clinics in um, which we see patients um, uh, you know, prior to the procedure um, and work with other specialists uh, as a team to kind of develop a treatment strategy for that patient. Um, and we also kind of uh, spend a lot more time on the floors, which means in the hospital, rounding and seeing patients and uh, getting them to define um, their disease processes and to discuss that with them uh, in person on the floor. Uh, a typical day for an interventional radiologist starts quite early. Uh, usually get up around five in the morning uh, come into the hospital around 5, 35, 45 uh, to kind of review the patients for the day, the cases we may be doing, as well as follow up on anybody who was uh, admitted in-house in um, the night before or that you did a procedure on the day before. Um, and that's definitely true for the bigger procedures that we do, whether it's the TIPS, which is a uh, transjugular intrapathic portal systemic shunt, or the GI embolizations for GI bleeds, the lower extremity angiograms that we've done. Uh, make sure those patients are you know, doing okay and uh, are progressing in terms of uh, where they need to get back to the rehabilitation uh, out of the hospital. Um, so that's really 5.30, 5.45. Uh, then at 6.15, we do our uh, rounds, which includes a technologist and uh, the chargers here uh, in our platform, um, and also medical students as well as uh, you know, the interventional biology team, which is the uh, you know, residents and fellows as well as the attending. Um, then we discuss the cases of the day, and those include a mix of outpatients and inpatients. So an outpatient is a patient who's coming for a, a scheduled procedure and has been seen uh, in clinic for the most part prior to that. So they already are kind of understanding why they're having procedure done, what needs to be kind of done before that. And then uh, also a mix of inpatients, which may be um, you know, a more emergent procedures from that same day, or uh, patients who are extremely sick in the ICU that uh, are not surgical candidates that uh, need something, uh, you know, a procedure from us that's more minimally invasive. Um, majority of our procedures are done with conscious sedation, uh, not anesthesia, and that means that patient is not at risk for uh, you know the, the risks that are inherent with anesthesia, uh, you know, endotracheal intubation, having a breathing tube in. A lot of patients, uh, if they have underlying lung disease or heart disease, may not be able to tolerate that, but they can still get sedation. Um, so after our rounds discussion, uh, probably lasts about 40 minutes. We begin our cases for the day uh, around 7 a.m. to 7:30 a.m. Um, and then, you know, uh, on a typical day, we may go from uh, each room here, which we have uh, six or seven rooms, uh, depending on the day, and may run um, five or six cases in that room, and those cases may last between uh, 45 minutes uh, to a few hours, depending on what the case is itself. Um, and so, independently, kind of everybody has their own uh, interventional suite or cath lab, uh, and then we run our procedures through those uh, labs. And towards the end of the day, um, if it's a call day, like my day today, um, I'll probably be here until uh, 8 uh, to 10 p.m. Uh, on a typical day, um, it's usually about 12 hours, so you know, 6 to 6, uh, or potentially longer, depending on the day for us. Um, and then we kind of finish our day um, uh, by discussing you know, the cases we've done, uh, especially as trainees, we like to go through the cases together. And if there's any interesting teaching points, we like to discuss those uh, amongst ourselves and with the, the attendees as well. Um, that kind of concludes the typical day. So, uh, before starting any case, obviously, uh, sterility is of utmost importance in what we do, and just like in any specialty, the procedures. Uh, so we kind of start off with the first scrub of the day, with a wet scrub, and then you got to go to our Avogard here, which is a dry scrub for the remainder of the day. Uh, unless I'm placing four catheters, 
uh, which is making a small decision and, uh, you know, placing important, whether it's chemotherapy for our different treatments. Uh, we always try to kind of make sure that, you know, that case is also extremely sterile just because you're implanting a device. So uh, in NMS radiology, we wear uh, white glasses, ideally, as well as a white apron. And so, uh, you know, that's just going to protect ourselves uh, since we're working with radiation every single day. You know, the x-ray emissions come from below the table, so we have protection around the table built in itself. Uh, however, it's one of these things you have to keep in mind, obviously, to protect yourself because we get these high dose exposures, um, especially during longer procedures here in NMS radiology. So uh, we also have dosimeter badges. Um, Usually there's one underneath your light and one uh, outside your light to monitor your radiation exposure uh, on a month to month or quarterly basis. And uh, we kind of, you know, make sure that we're within the safety limits that our, you know, advisory board kind of suggests. All right, so we've uh, yeah, okay. finished uh, two cases so far uh, this morning and we're moving on to our third one, which is a, a six-year-old man was referred to us from uh, a transplant uh, nephrologist. Um, Patient underwent a uh, renal transplant in 2016 and been doing very well off of hemodialysis. Um, renal transplant was functioning fine. However, he has uh, resistant hypertension now to medical therapy. Um, and so um, with the blood pressures all the way to the 150s and um, he's on multiple antihypertensives, uh, the next goal of investigation is to see if the renal transplant has any stenosis at, at the arterial or anastomosis. And so, uh, you know, we've gotten some non-invasive imaging uh, to begin with initially. Um, so you can see the renal transplant in the uh, right pelvic fossa and uh, kind of right here at the anastomosis is a little bit of suspicion. And this is an MRA, so that's an MRI with uh, angiographic phase. Um, and so we're looking here at the external iliac artery and there's a concern that there may be a small stenosis here given his symptoms. And so our plan is to proceed um, with uh, an angiogram. Uh, and so we discussed with the patient, you know, what to expect um, and potential angioplasty of the renal artery uh, anastomosis as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, our plan will be to go in uh, into the groin on the left and then go across the iliac bifurcation and cannulate the transplant, uh, measure pressures there as well as in the uh, iliac artery and the aorta to see if there's any actual differences uh, physiologically in pressures. And if there is, uh, we may decide to treat it depending on what we see. Um, this could also be done with intravascular ultrasound. However, uh, you know, pressure measurements are a little more accurate from a physiologic standpoint. So that's our goal uh, with this patient. That's our next case. Uh, it's still before noon. Uh, hope to keep the day going. From angioplasty refers to using uh, a wire catheter and a balloon, which can be drug coated potentially with, uh, you know, something to help intimal hyperplasia when you damage the artery. Artery tends to grow back. Um, and so that'd be a drug coated balloon or non drug coated balloon, which we call PTA, which is you know, or POBA, that's plain old balloon angioplasty. Um, and so the goal is to pass our wire beyond the stenosis, inflate the balloon, and restore the limbal diameter of the vessel that's there if there indeed is a stenosis. And that's how we generally treat um, you know, a lot of these stenoses in the body, whether it be you know, in the liver, in the biliary system, uh, in the venous system, or in the arterial system. Um, and so that's generally what angioplasty is. Uh, and, you know, measuring our pressures, uh, you know, here in our gentleman, we, we didn't find any pressure differences uh, across the anastomosis, so there's really no need to treat an underlying uh, anastomotic stricture because there really was none. So, um, you know, what we'll do now is just kind of continue to follow them, uh, make sure the blood pressure, uh, you know, stays under control, hopefully, and uh, find a different reason. One of the things we uh, thought of, uh, you know, kind of prior to the procedure and during was uh, potentially doing a, a renin uh, venous sampling uh, down the line in his native kidneys to make sure that there's no issues with the RAS, uh, you know, aldosterone system in terms of uh, physiologic feedback. So that'll be our next step potentially in, in working up his hypertension. Hello, I'm David Tabriz. I'm one of the assistant program directors of the Vascular Interventional Radiology Integrated and Independent Residencies at Rush University Medical Center. The history of IR, uh, basically interventional radiology was created in the 60s and 70s by Charlie Dodder. 
Um, at the time, uh, inter what interventional radiology was, was primarily an order-based service where a clinician would order an imaging test and the interventional radiologist would, pre would perform the angiogram to look at different blood vessels or different body systems. What Dr. Dodder saw was there was an opportunity to treat a lot of conditions at the time of diagnosing uh, with the angiograms or, or what have you. Um, however, as part of a training in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was never a clinical emphasis on, on treating the entire patient. Within the past five, 10 years, the ACGME, as well as the you know, National Interventional Radiology Societies have, have taken upon you know, the, the need for this more clinical patient interaction aspect of interventional radiology. And as such, interventional radiology has moved from being a subspecialty of radiology to a primary specialty. Clinical interventional radiology and current training is very unique in the sense of more than the first half of the training involves really honing in on diagnostic radiology skills. Being able to truly uh, read CT scans, MRI scans, plane films, ultrasound, and know the normal and abnormal uh, disease processes that are going on in an organ. So within interventional radiology, um, it, it's easiest to think about it as a service line driven approach. Uh, patients with various uh, diagnoses and conditions ranging from oncology, peripheral arterial disease, venous disease, hepatobiliary disease, genital urinary disease, men's health, women's health, all of these conditions may or may not have a, a procedure that interventional radiologists can offer. Um, each procedure requires a consultation, a preoperative evaluation, the procedure itself, and then as well as a post-operative op uh, um, evaluation to make sure that the condition that was treated has improved. At Rush, we uh, use the service line approach to evaluate and treat appropriate patients in um, every one of those aspects. Uh, we, use a, uh, we use a consultation service and have a fully functioning clinic, so we're able to evaluate and treat patients both from the inpatient and the outpatient scenarios. Uh, we work very closely with our other clinical specialty colleagues to really um, uh, do what's best for the patient. And at the same time, it exposes our trainees to that environment where at the end of the day, you're truly giving the patients the best quality care available to them. So we're standing in one of our interventional suites here at Rush. Um, there's some critical components to any, you know, Andrew suite or cath lab that you may experience uh, while doing rotations on interventional radiology or if you're a resident. And so there's, you know, these key components can be found kind of across the country, in North America and Europe, uh, and most, uh, you know, angiography suites in general. So uh, the workhorse of any suite is really the x-ray machine. So that's called uh, an II, which is image intensifier. Again, the x-rays are coming from the bottom and then absorbed, and yeah, to generate a, a two-dimensional picture. Uh, a lot of scanners also have capabilities of doing uh, three-dimensional scans, which we call a spin, and that generates uh, a cross-sectional image like a CT scan would. And those are specific reasons we use that. Uh, then we have, you know, uh, generally every room is stocked with catheters and wires. Uh, so we have kind of some of our general catheters that we use most often that are always on hand, and some angioplasty balloons if we need them. Um, also, generally, you know, stents and other embolization devices are also present within a room uh, that you may need, and we prepare about ahead of time, well ahead of time, to think about what we're going to use uh, for each procedure. Uh, and obviously, sterile equipment and uh, basic uh, uh, tools that we use on every case. Um, and then we have our uh, our table here with controls, and that kind of you know uh, this is your second hand here. It's like you know, as comfortable as you are with using your phone. If it's iOS or Android, we're as comfortable with our uh, technology and uh, manipulating the images uh, to create the pictures we need and uh, to optimize your imaging uh, to get the best results in our procedure. So uh, it's about a quarter to five. Um, we finished our uh, fourth case of the day, which was a. Uh, um, an emergent lower extremity angiogram and initiation of lytic therapy, which is uh, you know putting TPA into a, a clot for a patient in his 70s um, with uh, critical one ischemia in the past we've worked on before, um, who presented with um, uh, an acute uh, lower extremity uh, you know low, low extremity symptoms and an occlusion of a superficial femoral artery. Um, so we were able to perform an angiogram and uh, cross the occlusion. He has prior stents placed in the SFA um, and crossing that lesion, we were able to place uh, infusion catheters, but he's going to the ICU now, we just dropped him off. 
um, and uh, we're gonna lice him overnight and then check on on him tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'm on call tonight, so I'll be checking on him overnight, uh, making sure that his you know his numbers are staying uh, within a uh, decent uh, range. And then we'll bring him back for angiography tomorrow and see if there's any underlying uh, disease that he has below the level of his stents, which may have caused a seclusion. So it's about five o'clock uh, here in Chicago. Um, we've had a mixed day of things. We've done uh, you know some dialysis catheter uh, work. We've uh, done a little venous access with a port today, as well as a renal transplant angiogram, and then started an emergent uh, lysis uh, with a lower extremity on a patient with a acute one ischemia from the ER that we got today. So uh, my call is just uh, beginning for the night. Um, so we'll see what else uh, the night brings. But it's pretty much a typical day here at Rush. So um, for any medical students or trainees who are interested in uh, going down the path of interventional radiology and choosing it as a career, uh, it's very important to uh, you know, have early experience um, and try and get yourself exposed to interventional radiology as soon as, as you can. Um, you know, focus on your surgical clerkships and rotations, or if you're an intern, uh, you know, the surgical specialties you encounter during your internship. Uh, and then, you know, getting uh, uh, information from places like RFS is excellent. Uh, you know, they got a lot of programs to get involved in, just like I was when I was a trainee. Uh, I was in RFS when I was an intern. And then continue to help out uh, as much as I could during residency and fellowship as well. Um, and, you know, uh, IR is a growing field, so there's a lot of opportunity to learn and uh, to get involved, especially with research, which is uh, definitely recommended for anybody who's interested. So those are the kind of key points that I'd say, uh, you know, you should follow and explore uh, if you're interested in the field of IR. So uh, we want to thank you all from uh, Rush for watching. Um, you know, please uh, follow and subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you have any uh, interest or questions, uh, you know, please uh, drop them in the comments uh, below this clip. And uh, you know, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions or uh, concerns that you guys have uh, with regards to IR in general or our program at Rush. Uh, so thanks for watching, and uh, good luck to all the applicants out there.